We're not live, are we? Uh, we're getting about a couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go live right now. Oh, okay. You're good. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Eric Jackson, owner and president of the Washington Rebels, the new indoor football league in Kent, Washington. Eric, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Glad to be, glad to be here. Looking forward to this. Been looking forward to this for a while. Yeah. So, Eric, first question how, how do you take care? You got a lot going on. So, how do you take care of yourself, either personally, spiritually, physically, medically? How do you want to define that? Um, you know, I got to take things one day at a time, uh, especially with this huge project that we have going on, you know, starting a football franchise uh, in the state of Washington. So, um, you know, I get my workout sessions in when I can. Um, it's not as prevalent as, as it used to be before, you know, before the football team was put together. But I do stay uh, healthy as possible because I, I do know there's a limited time that I have, you know, before I have to get back on the grind and put this team together and put this organization together. So, um, Tend to eat right, try to get as much sleep as possible, try not to stress too much. So, yeah. So, in your background, your father was a pretty good um, musician, right? Yes. Yeah. And so, you talk about what is it like going to be like a, going up as a, as a kid of, mu of a musician? Yeah. Un unfortunately, I didn't know my father. Um, he passed away when I was four. Um, but I have older brothers that kind of filled in the gaps for me. Uh, so he was uh, the bass player for yeah, come up just a little bit closer. I'm sorry. Yeah. So he was the bass player for BB King. Went on the road with BB King and James Brown, um, and so he had a very successful musical career and a very successful military career. He was a gunnery sergeant in the military. Uh, so uh, the the music transitional situation kind of uh, trickled down to my brothers. So they had the musical talent. They were in musical groups as well. I unfortunately did not have that no, talent. No, they, <laughs> no, they didn't, pass, no, me. They didn't, they didn't pass to me. The business part passed to me. Absolutely. Um, but um, the, the musical accolades, those are all my brothers. Nice. Um, and so do you, do you, does your family have like some of the instruments your dad just play on? Uh, yeah. So my, my father's um, instrument is in, it's in the Seattle what is it? The music arts. I know what you're talking about. Like, yeah, where yeah. The, all the guitars are. About, yeah. yeah, so his guitar, I went there specifically to find his guitar and the curator uh, showed me which guitar it was, took a picture of it. So it was a pretty amazing situation, uh, you know, being able to see um, your legacy yeah, that's, and that's case. Pretty cool. Yeah, for all time. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. And so your brother's like the full-time musicians now or? No, no, no. When they were younger, they were. Okay. Um, and they lived three doors down from Michael Jackson, Jackson 5. Oh, wow. In, okay. in, in Gary, Indiana. Okay. So, um, they knew who they were. They were connected with them. And then their mother, which is not my mother. We, we have the same father, different, yeah. different mother. And um, their mother was their road manager. Okay. So they took them on the road and they, um, they did shows, opened up for um, different artists and things like that. So yeah. I don't know how successful it was because, like I said, I was younger. So yeah. I, didn't, I didn't even know they existed until recently. So I bet you hear some, like, some amazing stories from your other brothers, though, about the life <laughs> stuff. Yeah, I probably do. Probably some of Bella's probably, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, they would tell me stories about my father. Um, you know, how he was, <laughs> you know, that uh, that song, Papa Was a Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. So I never knew what those lyrics meant until they explained it to me. Huh. And a Rolling Stone is basically a, a man who was in the music profession that had multiple people, multiple yeah. women. So I knew about the multiple woman part. I yeah, know, I didn't even know that saw, either. It was very interesting. Had, like, I just thought it was like some dude had like women all over the neighborhood, right? Yeah, that's basically what it was. Yeah. Is he was a Rolling Stone, so that's what they were attributing my our, our father to. And uh, they said he was a he was a family man. He was a great man. Um, he always dolted on his sons, uh, me specifically. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I was four years old when he passed, but um, when I was younger, I saw pictures of you know him holding me and my sister. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they said that he dolted on me like nobody's business and so this kind of got you motivated to go to sports entertainment well it, it got me motivated to get into music honestly and um the music business is it's not what everybody thinks it is it's it's a very cutthroat i mean uh, the face star artist is out there for a reason right absolutely absolutely the, the 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 business side of it 
is way more cutthroat than the music side of it. Um, there are, everybody's trying to get ahead, everybody. And you got to have that talent, that it factor. They have to have that it factor and then you got to exploit it. And you got to make sure that you put it ahead of everything else. And it, it's almost like a babysitting job, to be honest with you. It's, you know, you got to find the right artist that doesn't make it to where you're doing a job. You got to find the right artist that you guys both work in synergy to where it's not a job. It's something that you like to do. It's like you get up in the morning and you want to do it. There are artists when you're just like, God, I just don't want to get up and deal with this guy. You know what I mean? Or, or, or a woman. So, yeah, you got to kind of pick and choose your battles. You got to think, too, like you have a group of people in a band, like four of them, if not on the same page. Or like if one says, I want to take a break, other ones are not truly dedicated. Like, like, you know, just like a startup, all, everyone has to be all in, right? They I have to be the same with the music group, too. If they're all, not all in, you're not going to make it on thing. I don't know how people would actually do that. I don't know how they would be able to deal with all the egos. Mm -hmm. It's that's that's listen, I have three sons. <laughs> they have all three different personalities. And when they were younger, I had to deal with that. I could only imagine an, a manager having to deal with, you know, multiple egos yeah. on a on a multiple level. That's just that's my, my guitar solo is not long enough. No, I'm absolutely the, not. I'm in the back of the stage too long or, you know, yeah. Why does you already have the press talk to the lead singer? We're in the band too. Right, right. Everybody wants to be the lead because everybody knows that the lead singer, you're going to be able to break out. And you're going to be able to get that solo career, and then you're going to be able to make more money as yeah. opposed to splitting it four or five different ways. So, yeah, the music business, it's not as... <laughs> yeah, It looks glamorous on TV. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I no. think if the, every one band that so-called makes it right. I mean, look, every Led Zeppelin, every Earth on a Fire, there's probably at least 100,000 who like... Absolutely. Like, doing whatever, you know? Yeah, you can't be a cookie cutter. You got to have... You got to you gotta find a niche. A niche that is going to be captivating for everybody. And then you got you to gotta work at that. I, I was talking to a, uh, a Sony executive producer, and he said, if you have an artist, have them stand in the middle of the street and think 400 miles to the left, 400 miles east, west, north, and south. And they said, that's where your audience is. And if you can captivate 200 people or, or 200 miles each way, then you have a fan base. Yeah. And I, I never thought about that philosophy in, until you look at it and go, you don't even have to go 400 miles. If you go 200 miles, that means you can tour yeah. 200 miles away from where you're standing. And how long have you been in the Seattle area? All my life. Oh, your life? Yeah, there? born and raised. Born okay, and raised. Yeah. Family is born and raised. I mean, well. Seattle does have a pretty music scene, I think. It has a very eclectic, eclectic that's a word. Very eclectic, eclectic music scene. Yeah. Um, very diverse. Um, but now, I mean, <laughs> I remember when the nightclubs were the heyday. When there was like every nightclub on every street. Yeah, nightclubs aren't even a thing anymore. They're not a thing anymore. I don't think they, they're you know, it's you a think, struggle. You think Kobe killed them? No, no, they were killed way before that. Or you know what really killed them is the casinos. Oh wow, yeah, no, yeah. Right, yeah. So the casinos really, really did away with with the nightclubs because they started bringing in all these old acts, like you know, with, with that. And then there would be like the casinos would have music inside of the casinos to where people were actually able to go and dance. Yeah. Now the nightclubs and the music business or the casinos they never really interacted. But there were sports bars that had like casinos inside of them, like poker bars inside of them. And yeah. when the casinos popped up, those had to close down. And I knew that for a fact because yeah. I actually owned one. And it ended up closing down. And uh, it, it, you don't recover from that. No. No. The nightclub situation, what, what, what did those nightclubs in was the violence outside. Yeah. And local law enforcement just got sick and tired of it. State Department got sick and but tired of it. I think they, I remember when I was growing up in teenage years in Odessa, Texas, you'd be a lot of violence in our nightclubs too, right? I think that's just um. Yeah, but it saying. wasn't being handled correctly. That's yeah. the problem. It was consistently. And then they were letting it spill from the inside out. And then local law enforcement had to get involved. And then they had to take care of it. And it's easier for the city to just say, you know what, we'll just shut you down. As opposed to just continue to keep yeah. giving you black marks. Yeah. I don't know if this is true or not, but I always heard that, like, back in the day, that's some kind of rule in Seattle where, like, two people were, like, arguing. They would go to a cop and say, hey, me and this person going to fight. And they would fight. Yeah. And whoever won, won. Yeah. In the it's, a, it's, it's, it's called the gladiator law, okay. basically. And I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure how prevalent that law is, but if you saw a local law enforcement officer and you asked him, hey, you know, I have a problem with this person. Can I fight? And as long as I, I believe... Don't quote me on it, but as long as no one else got involved and it was just you two and, long, and the officer was standing there watching, then neither one would actually go to jail. Okay. Now, like I said, I'm not really sure how prevalent that law is right now. Um, 
because I'm pretty sure the, AC, the NAACP would push back on it. ACLU would push back on it. Uh, I mean, that's going back to the Wild, 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 Wild West days, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so the city's not going to want that. No. It's, it's almost like lawlessness. Yeah. So have you ever, have you, you've heard of the Central Saloon, haven't you? Yes. So it's like two doors down. Yeah. And so I know a lot of, for those who don't know about it, Central Seattle has been open since 1892, supposedly. Like, supposedly like Novana, Pearl Jam, all these big time Seattle bands got started mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And like they sell live music, like two or three bands play every night, right? Mm -hmm. And I've gone maybe four times. And to me, it's kind of funny, right? Every time I go, there's a band that plays. I'm like, wow, you are so good. Like, what are you doing here, right? Yeah. Like, you should already be famous, famous at Stanley Stadiums. Next band comes up, like, you must have no friends because, man, you're horrible. Like, I just want to cut my eardrums out right now, right? Seattle was, a, was the mecca for underground grunge music. Mm -hmm. It's basically where it started. Um, so you had the Nirvanas, the Pearl Jams, you know, uh, the Soundgardens. And that's what pushed that, that grunge music to the 90s. And see, I mean, first it was Seattle was known for the Sir Mix a Lot age. Yeah. And then, then we didn't have anything else. And then the grunge age came in. And so you have two different genres that were basically built from Seattle. Yeah. That were basically manifested from Seattle. So with hip hop, is Sir Mix a Lot, Macklemore. There really weren't any other big name rap bars that came out here, was it? That's kind of no. surprising to me. They were the two icons, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of surprising, honestly. Yeah. Um, and they're still relevant to this day. Yeah. I know there's a lot, a lot of jazz music up here. Like Chrissy Jones started here, didn't you? I think. Mm, I don't know. I don't know if he did or not. Yeah. I mean, but I, I know he did come here. I know he did tour here. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I see, we have do do have a lot of good music up here. Right. I mean, like, like about two weeks ago, Chris Templeton, really nice, and Cheryl Crow was here. Mm -hmm. There's always like, of course, Taylor Swift came here. Like, yeah. there's always some kind of like big name concert here, right? Yeah. Um, either here or Tacoma. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been to a concert? I think it's called the Gorge. The Gorge, yeah. The, I, I haven't been to the Gorge, but I mean, I... I, I already thought about, yeah. yeah no, that's, that's my Gorge bucket is. list to go there. Is it really? Yeah. Everyone says it's like, this, this, everyone says like, that's that way it sounds and stuff, you know? Um, it's changed. Yeah. It's, um... It, it used to be where you could go there, be comfortable, have a great time, go home. Now, <laughs> it's almost like a... What's that thing called? Fire... So Ja Rule, he was part of Pride Festival. Yeah. Pride Festival, yeah. That. So now the Gorge situation has turned into that. Oh, man. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Right. So um, I don't know. Like I said, I've never been there. I just heard when people are going there, they're going there for like the weekend. Yeah. They're like, it's the worst weekend ever. Oh, they're man. just going there for the music. But it's with the, the pop-up tents and the yeah. potties and the overflowing. And it, yeah. It's just, it's, it's, That's too bad. Yeah. Unfortunately. But, so talk about your experience as actually being a nightclub manager back in the day. Um, I actually, so I started off, um, I started off as a bouncer and then just kind of transitioned into being a manager. And then I ended up owning a nightclub and um, it's, <laughs> it's an eight in the morning, sometimes six in the morning to a four in the morning job because you have to do everything. Even as a manager and an owner, you have to do everything. Your day never breaks. So, um, you know, there were some great times. Friends come in there, they would hang out. There, you know, we'd have, you know, artists that would come there and shows we put on. But managing the money and managing the employees, managing the hours and employees wanting more hours that you know you can't you can't really justify. Um, I would never. It's even on my bio. I would never own a nightclub again. It is not worth it. It's not worth the headache. And the the tax laws are incredibly harsh to nightclub owners. And then you have the cabaret license laws that are just, they change every year. They can change whenever they want. And now the liquor board laws have changed. So now liquor board doesn't control the liquor board anymore. It's, it has nothing to do with that. They don't control the liquor anymore. So the only time the liquor board comes in is if your liquor license isn't up to date. That's it. You see all the police department, they come in and they regulate stuff. Yeah, I'm sure you have to track a lot of stuff too. Like you don't realize, like you probably know you got to track the, the the alcohol because you know if the bartender's like like over pouring too much and being too like you know free with the alcohol, mm -hmm. that cuts their profit. You know, of course, course. he he cut if he pours not enough, customers will get mad. You know, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff can imagine. Yeah, you you have to kind of be um kind of have to be vigilant with with you know not just the alcohol but with the money and the proceeds because clubs are run on cash. 
um, you know, crash your credit. So you, you gotta have to make sure you're watching, but you're not that overzealous tyrant yeah. that is gonna scare scare not only your customers away, but it's gonna scare your employees away as well. Yeah. So, do you think a nightclub, how a nightclub, makes a difference to the success? Like, if it's like a hip hop club versus country club versus like I don't know, some kind of eclectic music scene. Does that matter? See, I think a a, a club that will thrive is an R and B club because you get to control the narrative. Um, you're not gonna have a lot of people who are going to R and B nightclubs or 80s nightclubs or 90s nightclubs that don't want to fight. Um, they say music makes you move. Um, I think music, some type of music causes aggression in certain people, unfortunately. Um, and then when you mix alcohol into it, it, it's it's a deadly combination. I remember back in the day, the clubs would play like Lil John music, punk music, and they wonder why people started fighting. Like, are you kidding me right now? Yeah, yeah, because they take they take music to heart. They take those words to heart. Yeah, and they're not thinking that they're not 100% with their mental faculties because they've been drinking. So you're like, okay, you're total, you're, you're drunk and you're listening to, to hardcore hip hop and you're getting aggressive. And your friends are egging you on probably. And your friends are probably getting aggressive with you as well. Yeah. So you see how that guy looked at you? So it's a volatile mix. It's a volatile mix. It's a mix that you don't want to be around. Yeah. And it's high testosterone. Um, and you mix alcohol, testosterone, whatever's gone on through that person's day. Not a good mix. So don't answer this if you don't want to, but do you think it's better as far as the whole environment for have like, suppose you have 100 people in the nightclub, so you rather have all 100 like drunk or all 100 of them high as far as like everyone having a good time, getting along, what does that matter? I would rather, I would rather have them high than intoxicated. Yeah, I, I agree, yeah. Yeah, intoxication, what that does is it, it brings out who you naturally are. Yeah. And if you're, a, if you're an a-hole, that alcohol is going to, it's just gonna rise. That liquid courage. Sometimes it's not even liquid courage. It's not courage that makes you do what you do. It's the inebriation, and then you forget those faculties that normally would keep you yeah. in line. You forget those. So here's a funny story. At least I think it's funny now. So I was in the army, right? Had a good friend, um, nicest guy around, calm. But if you drop drunk brown liquor, it like he changed, right? And so we was at this bar one time. It was me and my two friends, right? This other guy accidentally uh, either like shoved the other guy or like put, stepped in his shoe, or whatever. He like, hey, I'm sorry, my, no, my apologies. And one friend, that's 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 all right. The other guy, I'm not all right, and just knocked him out. Like, yeah, like, dude, what are you doing? But it, that's the thing; it's it's unnecessary. You're doing, you're you're putting yourself in an unnecessary yeah. situation because you're intoxicated, but yeah. you're not thinking. Correctly. Yeah. And if it was me, I'd rather have those people not even come to the club. Yeah. Or somebody who's intoxicated as opposed to somebody who's high those people they just want to chill yeah they just want to talk about getting high even higher yeah and they want to eat yeah and that's it and that's you a money maker I mean? right absolutely absolutely it's a money maker <laughs> you know i mean who doesn't want to make more money while your while your customers are just chilling yeah you know what i'm saying it's that's a headache that you don't have to deal with yeah cool um so next let's talk about your time in the washington state department of corrections um so we worked and this is a very short now, <laughs> topic. Is, is like, how long did you spend there? Uh, six years. Okay. Yeah, but I was with the felony department, so felony warrants department. And then I also owned a private security company as okay. well. And what we worked, we worked hand in hand with the Seattle Police Department. My private security company worked hand in hand with the Seattle Police Department. And what we did was, so um, the West Precinct didn't have a lot of officers, enough officers to um, focus on one specific area. So what I did was I commissioned my private security company to work with the Seattle um, Community Policing Unit. And what we did was we specifically sat in certain areas and we basically recorded and then we had it to detain and then made sure that there was, you know, local law enforcement came and picked up the, you know, the offender. And it was transients, drug dealers, prostitution, all across the board. So what are some things that you like liked about that job and didn't like? Sometimes we kind of felt like our hands were tied. Um, was, it was, it was very hard to get support from, from, um, you know, from the city. It was very, very hard. Um, thank you, man. Thank you. A little hot here. Um, yeah, it was, it was a little difficult to get you know, the right support. And then I would hear horror stories from local law enforcement officers that were just like, 
you know, we, we had to, like, release people, you know, people that we know were, were guilty. We had to release them because, one, the jails were filled, and then, two, prosecuting attorneys didn't really look at it as a high-profile case, so they would just kick them. And then uh, it got even worse during COVID. COVID, it was like, unless you murdered somebody, you could literally get away with anything. And it was, it was a rough time. During COVID, it was a rough time for not only local law enforcement, but business owners as well. Because, I mean, they relied on local law enforcement to have their back. But if the city council was like, we're not putting the money up for it for the extra time, you know. Yeah, I know recently the big thing has been to fund the police. My thing is like, you don't need to fund the police for actually, I think they need more money to like train on this escalation. Like how many cops actually like know how to shoot a weapon right, how to defend themselves, you know. They need training for that, you know. This yeah. Is, this is my opinion. Every year, there's a, there, you have to get recertified. And so it's not about defunding the police. And I never really understood why they would go and protest a situation to where if there were no lo local law enforcement officers, then who are you going to call? Yeah. Because you know you're going to get into a situation. Who exactly you're going to call? And if you, call, if you make a call and they don't answer, then you're going to complain that it took too long. Yeah. Or they never showed up. But on the other hand, you want to defund them. I mean, that does that makes no sense whatsoever. You want to defund the the, the stopgap from you either getting mugged or getting sexually yeah. assaulted, um, or or any any one of those things. And I just never understood it why you would want to do that. Yeah. So like maybe four months ago, this homeless person somehow got in the building. He bought his tent and like camped out in the office upstairs, right? And the owner like called the police, and the police told him. Is he doing anything to harm anyone? Like, no. Exactly. But just, well, he'll eventually leave. I'm like, what? Yeah. Are you kidding me right now? Yeah. Yeah. Unless because, they're harming someone, they don't well, do nothing. But then you have overzealous um, defense attorneys who like cases like that. Mm -hmm. They want low-profile cases against business owners so that they know there's going to be a financial payout. Yeah. And so it looks good on their resume. Yeah. Even though it's low class, it's, it's low priority. Because no prosecutor would actually even want to touch it. So they'll just be like, all right, whatever. We don't care. Yeah. I remember one time I was downtown. This paid me happened a year ago. This guy, I mean, like, he's obviously had a mental case, whatever. He got big ass tree stick and, like, it, like broke a car window, breaking car windows. Cops came, put him in cuffs. And these people were like, you're hurting him. You're hurting him. Like, are you kidding me right now? Like, do you see what he just did? All these people's cars? Yeah. All he did is, like, put his hands behind his back, right? They didn't hit him, you know, didn't throw him on the ground. Just, the cuss are too tight. I'm thinking, about, oh, my God, this is, this is ridiculous right Listen, here. Listen, just like Monday morning couch quarterbacks, there's also Monday morning defense attorneys, couch defense attorneys, who have no idea about the law, don't know anything that's going on with the law, has never studied the law, but think they can get involved when there's something going on and local law enforcement has to handle it. And they're so quick to pull their phones out. Oh, yeah. So quick to yeah. pull their phones out for no reason. But if you reverse the roles... And they were doing something wrong, and you pulled your phone out. Yeah. What do you think they? Or if they took a stick and broke their car windows. Exactly. No, don't, don't, don't videotape me. That's illegal. You know. So, it's a it's a catch twenty two for local law enforcement. And personally, I'm glad I got out of the business. Yeah. Um, I was getting desensitized anyways. And you, when you, when you see enough negativity, you become desensitized too. Yeah. Personally, I don't see how anyone could be a Seattle police officer, right? Just the stuff has to go through, you know. Of course, there's bad everything everywhere, you know. But I just want to see how to do all the protests, all the stuff that have to go through, you know. Like, yeah, not enough support. But I don't know that's so, like they're giving like, big bonuses to bring people on, but I don't know. Bonuses don't really matter if you're, you go to work every day and you're just like, I don't want to do this. Yeah. You know, you know you have to do it because you want to protect and serve. But you're, it, doesn't bec it becomes a job. It doesn't become fun. Even when you're with your comrades and even when you're with your peers. It doesn't become fun anymore. Yeah. So you've been all your life. A lot of people will say back when Seattle was nice. I moved in the year 2009. To me, Seattle's never been nice, right? It's always been different degrees of like badness, right? So when was Seattle actually nice as people want to say, right? <laughs> when was, when was this? Um, you know what? I can't answer that question because that, 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 that's an individual answer. Uh, people, I don't know. What I considered nice was you can go to a club or you can go to a bar and you know you're going to go home. Yeah. The only thing you had to complain about was the cigarette smoke. Now, you don't even want to go because you don't know if there's somebody that's carrying a weapon in there. You don't know if there's a bullet with your name on it. You don't know if you're going to come home to your family. Why would somebody want to go out and, and have to have that 
mental thought process going through your head everywhere. You bump into somebody who's having a bad day and they turn out to be the guy that might end your life because they're having a bad day and they take it out on you. Why would you want to put yourself in a position like that? No, you're right. You're right. Um, next, talk about your time with the, I'm going to say this name wrong. Uh, Winnahatchee Valley Skyhawks. The Wenatchee Valley Skyhawks? Yeah. Was that, what football league was that? So that was, that was part of the WS, uh, it was part of the West Sound uh, Football League. So they were underneath the um, IFL. So they were a tier underneath the IFL. There's multiple tiers with arena football. Um, and the closer you get to, you know, the IFL, the closer you get to the NFL. So they were, they were two tiers down. And we played in Wenatchee. We played at the Town Toyota Center. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was owned by a gentleman. Um, he had it for a couple of years. They, the last year that they were at the Town Toyota Center, they had, we had success. We went to the championship game. Unfortunately, we lost. Um, I was the general manager for a year um, when we went to the championship round. And um, we, we, had, we had a really successful year. I mean, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of ups and downs. Um, not, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say anything negative about the ownership. That it is what it is. It wasn't my team. Um, I was very happy that I was a part of that team. And this this is after you left the uh, director's job. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, the reason the the reason why I even got connected with them is they actually hired my security company to do private security for their their team, their owners. And then um, I went to Wenatchee with him and met with the. Uh, met with the assistant mayor and we talked about what we wanted to do as far as the community outreach for Wenatchee and for the Skyhawks kind of putting pairing those two together and it was it was uh it was a very fruitful conversation and um it led to the <laughs> it led to me not being part of the security team but being hired as the general just because of the connections that I had and what I brought to the table as far as my knowledge of football and my knowledge of marketing and putting important pieces together. And um, I brought the community together. We did outreach programs for the, for the high school and for the middle school. We did appreciation. We did um, local appreciation day for the first responders, which was an amazing event. Um, we actually had the chief of police, the fire department chief, and the head of the emergency come to the field we presented them with signed balls. So all, their, all of our footballs are inside of their offices that we can see right now. And, and then we had the, <laughs> I know this is kind of, kind of a 180, but we had the Banditos do our honor guard. Okay. So that was, that was a community thing that I wanted to put together. Uh, I didn't want people to think that the Banditos were just a negative MC club, that they could actually do some good. And so. Um, and do you still have your security company? No, okay. no, I, I, I let that go. Okay. Um, I, right. I don't have the time okay. at all. All right. No. So talk about how you went from like working for corrections, whatever it was, to being a general manager. That, some people think that's a hell of a leap, right? It was. But like I said, it was um, the owner of, the, Washington, of the, the Wenatchee Skyhawks contacted me, and they were going to New York, and they wanted me to fly with them. And they wanted to hire me to do um, some, you know, private executive protection work. And so that's, that's where it started. And uh, I, began, I got really close with the owner. Um, we started, he had a music company as well. And so I started to get to know his artists that were in the music business. And then we went and we flew to Atlanta where one of his artists was filming a movie. And so um, I just started to get integrated with what his businesses were uh, as far as the music was concerned. And then the football, it just kind of transitioned to you know, being part of the music business, his music business. And then just basically one day he's like, look, our general manager quit and I need somebody I can trust. Do you want the position? I was like, absolutely. And so I took it over and um, I started implementing, I started implementing ways of how the football team should emulate the NFL, how you should emulate the NFL on and off the field, how, you know, there are protocols that you need to follow there are rules that you need to follow on and off the field. And I started, I implemented those into the Skyhawks system and it worked. Um, we got rid of some bad apples and then we replaced them with excellent players. And I think that's what put us over the top and, and 
got us to the championship round and got us to that championship game. And this time period, this when you were also running political campaigns, or this afterwards? Yeah, no, I was. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. You said that. Yeah, I was still working. I was still working in politics when I was doing that. So I had political connections while I was while I was getting recruited by the Skyhawks. All right, you just like you're like campaign manager or another role or actually, um, yeah, I was the campaign manager. I'd been in politics for since 2013, and um, I uh, I was still campaigning and I was still working for this gentleman while I was uh while I was part of the Skyhawks. So how do you decide what campaign to work on? Like how does a, a politician convince you that they're worthwhile for you to spend your time of doing their campaign, so to speak? A thorough vetting of the, of the candidate is essential. And look, they don't have to be, they don't have, you and the candidate don't have to be aligned, but you guys have to be in lockstep with where you want to see the future and why he wants to run, he or she wants to run. Um, if there's a disconnect on that, it's never going to work because you're going to you're going to have an idea of how to win and that person's going to have an idea how to win and it's never going to, it's never going to mesh. And how many campaigns have you actually worked on? Three. Three. I obviously don't say no names, but of those three. Oh, no, no. We can say names. Okay. I, I'm very, very proud of the, the okay. work I did. Okay. Absolutely. So those campaigns, like, let me backtrack. From your point of view, working these three campaigns, what are some characteristics a, a good a, a good politician needs to be successful? And what are some bad ones they need to make sure they you know, fuck it up, so to speak? Truth is one of the most important. Look, I know politicians lie because they know if they tell the truth, not a lot of people are going to want to vote for them. So I understand that you have to lie in order to get people to, to hear what they want to hear in order to get the votes. But there are candidates that just won't lie. They'll tell the truth. And if you let them know, look, I'm going to tell you exactly who I am and what my campaign is about. If you don't like it, don't vote for me. It's, it's a simple, it's, it's, a, it's a yes or no situation. Um, I, I worked with a candidate the first time I ever ran a campaign. I worked with a candidate in 2013. And it was the opposite of telling the truth. It was. His whole campaign was, was all about... Your, your political campaign cannot be all about you. It has to be about the people. It has to be about the community. It has to be about the community that you want to represent if you get elected. Because the people hold the power. You don't hold the power. The people do. They can elect you or they can get you out of there. So if you're one of those guys that your lies are easily debunked, probably not a good idea for you to be in politics. Absolutely. And the guy that I worked for, he was like that. It's, you know, he... He was one of those unfortunate politicians that felt that he needed to be in the political office that he was running for because of, one, the color of his skin, and two, because he just felt that, I think it was his narcissism, in all honesty, that, that got in the way, that he felt that he, that he was needed. And nobody else felt that way. Nobody else looked at it that way. You know what I mean? It, it was unfortunate. Because he's not a bad person, he just um, he just he's he's not the right person that you want to be running for any type of office. Period. This is I would like I would love to see one day, but I'll never would ever happen. Like suppose there's a candidate, they're going to a press conference, a reporter like says, "Hey, we found this about you." Like brings out all the skeletons out of his closet, right? Mm -hmm. The candidate says, "Oh, that's fine and good. Now let me tell everyone you're 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 garbage," and lays out all the reporters like dirty laundry, right? I, mean, I know that would never happen, right? No, but that'd it, be so fucking funny. It, it 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 wouldn't happen because then you would alienate the whole press corps. I know and nobody but, would actually want to interview. You. I know that'd be so funny. I think right. It'd be yeah. probably long, you know. Yeah, yeah, Tom Brown, that's true. Uh, yeah, but let me tell you more about your skeletons. Like you did this, you did that back in high school. You cheated on your girlfriend. Blah blah blah. I mean, it never happened. Well, that's interesting. You said oh, that. Oh man, that'd be hilarious. Well, yeah. Well, the the first the first campaign I ever worked on, that was the problem. Mm -hmm. There were people that were coming to me and saying, this person's skeletons are coming out and there's no way to stop it. Yeah. And it was coming from inside of his own campaign. And he was so blinded to it that he never saw it. He never saw it coming. And so that stuck with him and it sticks with him now. It, 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 it's not going to go away. Yeah. So anytime you talk about him, say his name, it's an automatic, mm, yeah, yeah, not really comfortable with that person. Yeah. Which is... The last thing you want as a candidate, because you want people to resonate with you. When your name is spoken, you want people to go, 
oh yeah, I looked at his policies. I'm not really comfortable with this or that, but there's a possibility I might vote for him. Or mm, I'm not really comfortable with this policy. I'm not going to vote for him. I'm going to vote for his opposition. Yeah. In a way, I think it's unfortunate. Like, I think everyone has skeletons. Everyone's done stuff they're not proud of. I think right. I think we have people who are like too squeaky clean running right. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm like, to me, if like you're an Eagle Scout and you're in your 40s and 50s, like, have you ever even lived your life right? That is very true. But here's my question to you: If you know you have skeletons, do you want those skeletons to keep continuously keep rearing their ugly head every time you run for office? No, but I, what I would do. As I were like my first press stop, I would say, "Hey, here's all my skeletons." You would get in front of it, correct? Yeah. Right. Everything I've done in the past. Yes, exactly. And that's that's a normal politician attitude. Is look, I know what I did wrong in 2013 yeah. or 2014, so let me make sure I don't make that same mistake in 2015. If I have skeletons that people were talking about in 2013, let me make sure that I clear those up yeah. so that there's no more skeletons that they can utilize because that's what they have to go on. They're going to go on what you did a year ago. And what those skeletons were, and since you didn't clean them up, they get to use those yeah. over and over and, they, and, and over they, again. And then they own a narrative on you. And they never go away, and you never get a, you never get ahead of it. Did you hear what RFK Jr. did the other day? Absolutely. Oh my God. Absolutely. Now that's one thing I would not be honest, right? Like no one knew about it. He just no, you're wrong. They did know about it. That's why he had to get in front of it. Oh, they they, they, they... it was already circulating. They knew that he him? had killed the bear. Okay. Yeah, he had killed the bear, and then he had like lied and said that it was a bike accident or something. Yeah. The the AP News already knew about okay. it. I, I was in the press that he just had a random interview with Roseanne Ball. No. And he just said it out, no. out of nowhere. Now he's being investigated by the AG's office. Yeah. You know? So, and, and the Wildlife Commission is going to come after him. So, I mean, there's, there's ways that you can get ahead of it. I don't think a politician should get ahead of it personally. Yeah. I think you should, you have PR people yeah. for that. People do, yeah. You know? PR people that do that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So you want them, have them tear, take care of the narrative. Like, I'm saying, you killed a bear? And took it to Central Park. And then lied. Yeah, and then for like, years. And then kept the bear in the car while they wouldn't eat dinner. Right. Like, yeah, I don't yeah, I, I don't I don't get it. And all the people he told the story to Roseanne Barr of all people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's one person you definitely don't want to be talking about or talking to. Yeah. Period. So yeah. But yeah, man, um, I love politics, to be honest with you. I ran after the first campaign, I ran two successful campaigns after that. One Raymond Miller out of Marysville, amazing, amazing gentleman. Um, and then Herbie Martin, who's like a brother to me mm -hmm. out of uh, Mill Creek. And now he lives in Puerto Vallarta. And he's actually, he's part of our football organization. Okay. Uh, he used to work for DOD, he's got DOD connections. So um, we have some heavy hitters on our, on our organization. But when you first step into the spotlight of running up your first campaign, um, you're green, but you kind of believe everything. And I did. I was one of those... I'm super happy being a part of a political campaign. I get to be in the the, the mix with yeah. you know judges and other politicians, um, and you kind of lose sight of what's important and what's important are the people. Are you still kind of involved with politics now? Absolutely. Not lines? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm working with a guy, a gentleman right now, who's actually running in Tacoma. He's running uh, the 29th district. He's running for um, um, House of Representatives. Okay. Um, yeah. So. It's, uh, he's a really, he's a really good guy. So he's an up and coming superstar, so to speak. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. In the democratic party. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, I, I always have my finger on the pulse of, of politics. To be honest with you, I need to stay in politics because if you're connected with a lot of politicians, especially in Seattle, they'll help make your organization that much easier. Especially if I decide that, you know what, we, you know, want to grow even yeah. bigger, um, having politicians working with you and you working with them directly, raising money for them, getting them where they need to be. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's one of those things that you, as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, you want to do that. You need to, you need to have that. So I know the state of Washington has been like blue, for like the last 10,000 years. <laughs> the state of Texas has yeah, been absolutely. like 10,000 years. Yeah. But is that really a good thing for the citizens, right? To seem like, seem like to be blue and red. Yeah. So it's make it more of a mix. I don't know how you do that. It's been like that. It's never going to change. Um, the political landscape of it is reds are conservative, blues are liberal. It's just what it is. You know, there are stricter rules in red states than there are in blue states. And, um, the people in the red states, they want it like that. So, uh, I, I would never, never, you know, I would never want that to change. 
Okay. You know, one thing people don't realize too, like it's a different degrees of parties each where like, you know, a Republican in Texas is probably not a Republican of Maine, you know, Democrat in Washington, probably not a Democrat in Texas, you know, there's like different areas of things I think, you know. Well, um, a Democrat in Texas would be way more moderate than a. Absolutely, Washington. he would. Yeah, he would be. He would be moderate to central, to centrist, um, because he would have to be. It, it would. It would be no choice. Yeah. You. You can't be. You can't be in Texas and be a liberal. There's no way you'll get driven out of town. Yeah. So you. You have to be a centrist, maybe even a centrist right, um, and. You don't have to be ultra conservative, but you'd have to have some of those conservative values. Yeah, absolutely. In order to survive, you have to do that. Yeah, I think it's common sense too. Like to me, if you're a Republican in the state of Washington, it's harder to win. But if you're a Republican, you're out there, you know, you're talking like anti trans, anti gay, you know, anti abortion. Like you already have no chance at all. You guarantee you have no chance with those stances, I think. But see, those are, those are hot button issues for Republicans that they know their base is going to go wild for. Yeah, true. But then you win the base, you win the primary, but then you're screwed in the election. Right. And you, you win your primary. Absolutely. But your base only covers a percentage yeah. of what you need in order for you to win. And um, it literally goes back to the gentleman I worked for. Uh, he didn't have a base or a coalition yeah. at all. Um, what, he, what he built his name on was, and what's interesting is what you just said, is if you're in Texas, can you be a Democrat and be moderate, centrist, or right? Like I said, right in the middle, going to the right. He was from Detroit. And he always would say, I'm a Democrat, but I'm a leaning Republican. Not in Detroit, you're not. Yeah. There are no Republicans in Detroit. Detroit's a blue state, period. So I think that was more of a talking point to reach out to other Republicans that didn't know that this black man was running an office, running for office, that he thought that he could Yet, yeah, but he had no chance. You no chance to run. Period. That was the problem. No money, no infrastructure, no base, no belief. You're gonna lose every time. Yeah. yeah. So moving on, um, you, you're you're doing some little housing here too, right? Yeah. Can you talk about that? How that was gonna work? So one of my best friends who I grew up with, his name is Rajiv, and he has he created a system, and it's called the um, Q box system. Basically what it is, it's manufactured homes. But what he does is he cuts out the middleman. So the middleman is the one who actually creates the building pieces, you know, the, the sidings, all of that. Well, Rajiv creates that out of his own warehouse. So he cuts out the middleman, which is $100,000. The warehouse here in Washington State? Warehouse in, well, actually a warehouse in Seattle. Okay. It's on Aurora. And so he cuts out the middleman. Not only that, but he's got a system to where the time frame cuts down. 16 weeks, he can have a house built. Not only that, you give him 12 to 15 skilled or unskilled labor workers, and he can have that built. That's unheard of. And so he's already building a house right now on Capitol Hill. It's a $2.5 million house on Capitol Hill, which is amazing. He's, this guy is a one-of-one, one, to be honest with you. He's like a, a, he's like a Rembrandt of building houses. And so he's building a house right now, it's almost like a $2.5 million house on Capitol Hill. That should be done fairly quickly. But he approached me and said, look, I'm very comfortable with what I'm doing right now. But what I want to do is I want to work with transitional housing. I want to work with unhoused individuals. And we don't call them homeless. They're unhoused individuals. That's what they are. And he said, I want to work with them. I want to work with the city to see how we can... Here's the thing. There is no way on earth you're going to be able to eradicate homelessness. There's no way on earth. Okay? One, there's way too much money into um, people being unhoused. But what he wanted to do was he wanted to work with the city and see if his cue box system would be able to fit inside of their structured, basically their structure of how, how, can, how we can decrease the unhoused situation. And... I said, well, look, I'm already working with the Chamber of Commerce. I'm already working with the city council. One of the city councilmen actually sits on my board. Why don't I get you in front of the mayor of Kent and see how we can utilize your system to help that narrative? Because 
that's a huge narrative in the state of Washington is people who are living on the streets, uh, living in back alleys, you know, the, the encampments. Those are, that's a huge, huge, huge problem. And we haven't been able to solve it. And I don't think it will be solved, but I think we can decrease the level of visibility if we implement, you know, certain ideas, certain ideas that will work. And I believe, my heart of hearts, I believe that his, this Q box system, this transitional housing will help. And he feels that my organization will put him kind of in the driver's seat in front of the right people to say, hey, you know what? Let me utilize my business and see if we can, we can do something. Well, the people he wants to put in there is a, a criteria. Like you have to be like homeless for six months, free of drugs, have a job, about to lose a home. Then you got like See, criteria. I think that would be, I think that would be something that the city council or the mayor would have to kind of implement. They would, we, we're about just building the, the system and building the house. They would have to determine if it's for women who have four or five kids who are- Kent, correct? Well, we can't do it in Kent because Kent has a law that okay, states that okay, there's okay, no- Okay, you tell me that. Yeah, but Federal Way, Auburn, uh, those surrounding areas that don't have those laws, absolutely. My question would be this, right? All these cities, like my opinion, all these city governments have failed to fix anything, right? So why partner with them? Why not just build on their own or partner with another organization? I don't think they failed. I just think they just don't, they don't have the right people in charge um, because a lot of the profit that goes into that situation kind of gets lost in the shuffle. And I'm pretty sure some of those higher ups are getting a lot more than what they're expect they're, they're supposed to be getting. Yeah. I'm just, I'm not trying to speak out of turn. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kind of surveying the land. Yeah. And my from my what thing I've has heard, always been like, you know, can you, maybe they've done that. I just miss it. Like, can you show something, you've increased something, decreased something, like something's improved since you've been here. Right. Like, right. Right. Something. Right. Listen, I, I was driving from Everett to Seattle and I was, I was talking to an associate of mine and I was telling her, our infrastructure is not where it should be. Our roads from Everett to Seattle are horrific. And that is something that needs to get fixed because that means that the worse our roads are, the more damage those cars become, which means the insurance rises, yeah. which means people have to decide if they're going to buy groceries or if they're going to pay for the insurance for their car that just got wrecked because yeah. there's a pothole that didn't get fixed. And Quest doesn't complain too in the area like, you know, we have all these high tax, like what is the money going to, right? You know, like all the public safety stuff, the roads, infrastructure is like. It's a question mark. Yeah. Where is the money going? You know, that's, that's a question for Seattle City Council. Yeah. You know, so, but this transitional housing situation, um, I believe that it would be transformative um, in front of the right people. I already have um, real estate investors who are interested in doing that. And basically what it is, is we find a real estate investor who has the property and then who has the financial backing. And then we just go ahead and say, where do you want the house? Yeah. And then we build it to spec and we go from there. And you decide if you want to use it for private or public and we go from there. But that's a situation where you can literally have multiple houses being built consistently and work within that system of trying to tame this unhoused situation. Yeah, well, like you said, it, like I, 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 I say all the time, people are way smarter than me with way more money than me having to fix it. So what, Absolutely. what I hope I have, you know. Absolutely. You know what, all I do is I try to give solutions and if people want to take them, absolutely run with it. Yeah. So now next, down to your football team. First question, where did the nickname Rebels come from? Well, <clears throat> that comes from my general manager. And I gotta give, gotta give shout out to Tony. Uh, Tony Cowan, my general manager, and uh, my coach, Sam Smith, amazing to amazing gentleman. Um, it comes from, I, I basically purchased the team from Tony Cowan. Tony had a team in the GDFL, and he had been wanting to get into the IFL for years. And I happened to meet him uh, through a mutual acquaintance of ours, and we had discussion. One thing led to another, and I, I looked at him and I said, look, man, I don't want to go a full six months of trying to find a team when you already have a team and I have the ability to get you where you want to be. You want to be in the IFL. I have the paperwork to get us in the IFL. I need your team. And he gave me two stipulations. You want my team? I just need two things. I need you to at least let me keep half of my players and let me keep my coach. And I said, absolutely. And here we are now, eight months later, we built the organization. We are, we were going to play in 2025. Um, but some things happened that were out of our control. So 
we ended up kind of backtracking and we decided to play in 2026, which is good for us because then it gives us the ability to do everything we need to do correctly right the first time so we don't have to do it second time and to build this organization even bigger to where when we're in playing in 2026, not the city of Kent, but the state of Washington is going to be proud. And that's what we're building. Oh, and I had to give a shout out to two other gentlemen who literally helped me build this organization. If it wasn't for them, there would be no Washington Rebels. Cheyenne Salah and Daniel Blue, they have been my inspiration. Yeah, Daniel Blue is the best. Daniel is, listen, if it wasn't for Daniel, I would have never met Cheyenne. Yeah. And if it wasn't for Cheyenne sitting down and talking to me and saying, you can do this, I would have never put this team together. Yeah. And so Cheyenne has been not only a brother and a mentor, but he's been one of my best friends. So talk about the thought process y'all went through deciding to move from 2025 to 2026. I had to, I had to do that because I felt that I don't know if a lot of people know about putting a football, not a football team, but an organization together it takes a lot of capital, <laughs> a lot of capital. That's why billionaires own NFL teams and millionaires don't. So raising the capital that we needed to raise in order for us to get where we needed to be, which is you know, part of the league and, uh, you know, the arena and stuff like that, that takes a ton of capital. And I was on pace to doing that, but I was also, um, I also didn't want to put us in a situation where we were rushing everything and things were going to fall through the cracks. Excuse me. So I had to decide what was smarter to rush the situation, get the money and rush it. And then rush putting a team out on the ground and possibly ending up the first year being a failure. Or do I want to put a juggernaut together for 2026 and shock the IFL like nobody's ever shocked them before. Like there are so many pieces that we're putting in place with the IFL that they've never seen before that are, it's, it's going to be eye opening. Kind of like um, HBO's Hard Knocks. We have that as part of the IFL with our team, putting that in place as we speak right now. So a lot of things the IFL has never done before, we're going to implement that in 2026. So holding off for a year, it, it's, it doesn't kill us. Actually, it just makes us stronger. So you have the NFL. Is like the IFL like like consider like maybe like the double A version of the NFL? Like it's the development league. Yeah. Okay. So we're the development league um, for the IFL or for the AF the NFL and the CFL. Okay. Yeah. So our players can get picked up by either the CFL or the NFL. Um, we we can have former players, you know, come down and actually want to play with us. I have a, a former player, Jordan Babineau, literally sitting on my board of directors. He okay. is a an advisor of mine. Is there a stat showing like how many players actually get a chance to go to NFL from the IFL? Um, so 181 players, NF, uh, IFL players were selected to the NFL okay. in the last 15 years. Is that through like through free agency to actually get, to actually get drafted? No, they, what they do is they get scouted and then they get picked up and they sign a contract. Okay. They sign like, um, they get on the practice squad okay. and if they make the practice squad, then they get on the field. All right. Is there like a, or like their uh, IFL players like actually like made in, in the IFL, I mean, in, in the NFL, like people, if you say the name, people will know it. Yeah, you can go on the website. You can go on the IFL website, and it literally will show you all of those players who played in the IFL okay. are either former NFL players or current NFL players. And how are the rules different between the two leagues? Uh, they are because the rules are it's 75 yards, and then it's 50 yards uh, left or right. But it's 75 yards from end zone to end zone. So it's a faster-paced uh, football game, way more excitement, uh, and it's it's almost like you're 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 on the field because if you're close enough to those pads it, it's it's a 90 percent chance you're going to see a player hitting those pads and hitting the wall and it's going to get really close to you if not them leaping over the pads and into the stands and the wall that wall I mean, i'm guessing not concrete or brick wall is like no no, no 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 it's it's a it's a rubber okay. so you have the pads what are rubber and then you have like the styrofoam wall so it it, it has a little bit of give okay yeah and so why can't, is it Kent just because they had the forward center there or why can't specifically for the team? Kent has embraced us even before we even put our team on the field. And I'm loyal to Kent. Um, but Kent has been wanting this. And the market, just the partnership with um, <laughs> my CFO, who is an amazing woman, um, Michelle. She's a C she's the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and then the president, Zenobia, president of the Chamber of Commerce, amazing, amazing people. 
um, they actually helped me basically walk me through the gates of, of the Chamber of Commerce and uh, who to go after as far as a strategic partnership is concerned. And um, they just basically laid the groundwork for me to, to, for the city of Kent to embrace us as the new it thing. Is the product facility going to be the Showware Center too? It's, we're going to use the Showware Center as a okay. product facility too. And we're going to be, we're, we're going to let the city of Kent come and watch the practice. Okay. So it's going to be an open practice. Okay. And like, how does the lease work? Do you like sign a 10 year lease with them? Do you get like, like, no, we're probably going to sign a three year lease with them first and we're going to see how three years goes. Um, usually when you start a um, expansion team, it's one to three years before you start seeing success. Um, I believe just with the people that we have in place with my advisors, um, I've basically built a juggernaut of advisors and, and guys who are advising me on everything from football to marketing. Um, one of my one of one of the best advisors that I could ever um, be part of and be a partnered with is Randall Morris and Eddie McMillan. I I couldn't have I couldn't have asked for two better gentlemen to be a part of this than those two gentlemen, and they have walked me through a ton of stuff. They're philanthropists and they're they're known in the state of Washington, and um, for those guys to want to embrace what I'm doing, you can't buy stuff like that. No, no. and and then I just acquired last week literally acquired my advisor who is going to advise me on everything. Um, he's, he's, he's been amazing. Um, Craig Jackson, who used to coach for Rainier beach and is connected to slick Watts, Donald Watts. Yeah. Um, Craig is actually, he's advised me on quite a few things in the last couple of days and it's been a godsend. So what, what days does the, Teams play their games on Saturday, Sunday, Friday. So what's going to happen is 2025 and 2026, it's going to be changed. So the the uh, the uh, months the months aren't going to change, but the days will. And remember, when we play in the Showware Center, we're also playing. Uh, uh, we're we're also scheduled with the Thunderbirds, right? We're also scheduled with the Sounders. So or the Stars, excuse me, Tacoma Stars. So they play in the same facility. So we have to make sure that our schedule doesn't overlap with theirs. So. Um, yeah, our website's going to be up, so you, you'll be able to check out the, the website and the start date um, when we're going to have our first home game. You know, you'll, you'll have all the information that you need. And so how are you going to go about, like, as far, I guess, I guess you don't recruit players, but how are you going to get your players, right? How are you convince a player, like, to be part of your team? I've left that up to my coach and my okay. general manager. Okay. I, I want to I be kind of a hands-off um, owner. I feel if I just stay in my lane, mm -hmm. focus on the financial part, I focus on building the organization and growing the organization. I think if I do that, they will do exactly what they need to do okay. in order to put the best team on the field. So can you talk some about your business background that'll make, make sure this is all off a successful venture for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. My business background, um, like I said, the music business has taught me how to navigate rough waters, taught me how to navigate dealing with people who are not the easiest to deal with. Um, but then I've also dealt with executives as well. So um, being able to walk in that space and my political background has, has, you know, groomed me for, I believe my political ground, background has groomed me for being successful as an owner of a arena football team. And, um, you know, I, I, without that, it would have been, it would have been a struggle, but um, not fearing talking to executives, entrepreneurs, um, business like men of, of, you know, like yourself, myself, Talking to them and being comfortable talking to them is extremely easy. So what do you think makes someone a successful business owner, regardless if it's football, basketball, baseball, whatever level? What do you think makes someone a successful sports owner? Get up every day and ask yourself, what didn't I do yesterday that I can do today? What made me successful yesterday? What can I capitalize on? and use that to launch today. I never, I never look at me building this organization as a job. It is always, what idea did I not use yesterday and what can I use today? Always. My sleep patterns suffer, unfortunately, because of the, your creative side of your brain is consistently running. It is always looking for new and inventive ways of finding a financial path for your organization. And that's the biggest thing is, is having multiple financial paths for your organization in order for your organization to survive and sustain and have sustainability. That is important. But for me, 
It's not about me wanting to outshine anybody. It's about me wanting to outshine myself. I want to prove to myself that this is the business that I got in and this is the right choice that I made. And are you the only owner? You have other like minority owners? No, we don't have any minor, minority okay. owners yet. We have shareholders okay. um, because we've, we've allocated enough shares to where people can buy into the business. Um, I have somebody here who actually is a share owner. So she, she, she was one of the first uh, shareholders to buy into the business. Okay. And we have 5 million shares that you're able to purchase at a dollar a share, which is pretty much unheard of. Yeah. And how I'm doing my organization is I want, I want my organization to do what the Green Bay Packers did, to eventually be able to share it on public and uh, be able to share it on the NASDAQ and for people to, for it, for it to be publicly owned. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was first teams, everything about the, the sexy part, you know, the TV, the football team, whatever. Let's talk about the non sex the admin part, like the accounting, the bookkeeping, <laughs> the HR, the uh, admin part that actually has to run the organization. Let's I, I honestly, I have to hire people for that. Okay. I, I, I have to hire out people for that. They, they are smarter than me. I, I know, uh, <laughs> I stay in my lane. My lane is the political side, the business side, the strategic partnership side. Okay. Um, with you, we've already talked about strategic partnerships and how we want you to integrate your business and you know your podcast directly into the Washington Rebels. I think it would be an amazing uh, strategic partnership to have you inside of the the Showware Center, um, doing game day, yeah. it, uh, doing interviews. That would be that would be something unheard of. Yeah, definitely. Um, so how does it work for like players? Right? Um, is it like a full time job for them? Like no. No, so they get paid. I, I'm I'm not going to speak how much they get paid, um, because in, that's in their contracts. But it's a game to game situation of their payment, and they have six home games and six away games. Um, we encourage them to have another job. We don't want this to be their full time job, so you can't look at it as a full time job because financially it's not going to sustain you. But we encourage them to find another job. But here's the beauty of us partnering up with the city of Kent is our players. When we have strategic partnerships with all the businesses in the city of Kent, our players will be able to possibly have a job with each one of those strategic yeah. partners to where they're getting, they're getting a, a good job, but it's not going to sacrifice them playing on the field. So what's the time commitment for a player? Like 30 hours a week, 40 hours a week to be a player? As far as being on the, on the team? Yeah. Well, you got to look at, we want you in training. We want your practice. And we're probably going to have, you know, Practice three days a week, um, and then game day, yeah, which is four. Okay. Um, so how is the health insurance for? I don't know it's called health insurance, but like suppose like you have a player, and they pull a hamstring or you know have a you know a concussion, and they can't go work for their job. How would that work? We have Ellen. I deal with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Those are those are questions that unfortunately I can't answer, uh, because our lawyer will. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like, I got it. I got it. Yeah. So I, so um I went to the. IFL YouTube channel earlier today, and it, and it said where like the IFL did we see sign a media rights deal, and a deal with Adidas. We did. So how does that work? And like, does each team get a certain percentage of that? Like, yeah. How, talk about the, the yeah. Unfortunately, I can't I can't talk about the numbers. Um, but yeah. So we signed, the IFL signed two media deals. Um, we have a media deal with CBS, and they actually do our championship games. And then the other media deal that we just signed, they're actually going to be doing all of our games. Okay. And then Adidas is going to be the official sponsor for the IFL. Okay. Um, so that's that's unheard of, to be honest with you. It's 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 um, the commissioner Todd Tryon. He is every every organization should have a commissioner like him. To be brutally <laughs> honest, he is an amazing amazing guy. He is one of those guys that you can call and you can just talk to him, and just just shoot the shit shoot the shoot the crap with him. Yeah. Um, and what he's done for the IFL. Is second to none. How long has 15 I, years? Is IFL's been around 15, 15 years? 15 years. It's been it's nonstop. Okay. It has been successful 15 years. And they're still gaining momentum. They're still, we're the next expansion team. And they're still picking up other expansion teams. Cities want to be a part of their 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 organization. Is there a team in IFL that everyone looks up to? Like this is like the like the crown jewel of the IFL. Like this team's always successful. Yeah. The best organization. What the organization. Do? That's how they look at it. They're like, okay, out of, out of all Arena football, the IFL is the crown jewel. They might not get the the biggest sponsor or the the most um, visuality because everybody knows, you know, Dwayne Johnson owns 
the USFL or US, UFL, which is the merger of the XFL and the UFL, yeah. USFL. So he owns that. So his exposure is, is bigger, but it's also one, it's also a smaller league. And two, um, they also have only eight teams. Okay. We have, we will have 19 teams. Are there any other extra teams besides yours? We won't know until the end of the season. Okay. The end of the season is championship game is on the 17th. Okay. All right. Um, and everybody should watch that game, by the way. It'll be on CBS. So the meteorites deal, you still have to, you have to get like a local coverage for your team, like a lo local radio station, local TV station to announce your game. Yeah. Announcer. I've already been working on that as okay. we speak. We have a couple of local radio stations that decided they want to pick us up. Um, I even have a local radio station that I'm going to be in negotiation with in Wenatchee that wants to televise our games, which is unheard of. Um, but I'm not going to say what, what local station we're going to utilize for our games until the paperwork is done with that. And like, what, what's the business model, right? Like, how do you make money Is it based off ticket sales or vendors no. and stuff? No, like, you never want to run your organization just off of ticket sales and, and merchandising. You want to make sure that you have outsider, outside in, influence and outside venues in order for you to have sustainable, sustainable money. So I work with the Seattle Seahawks alumni group. Eddie McMillan, Randall Morris, that whole group, they are willing to do fundraising for us. So being part of the Chamber of Commerce, being part of the city council, being part of the Seattle Seahawks alumni, those are pathways financially for us to succeed. Not only that, I'm connected in the music world. So, you know, my advisor, Craig Jackson, he is connected to national music artists. So being able to utilize um, the Showware Center to put on shows, you know, under the umbrella of the Washington Rebels, there's another financial path for us. So we have multiple financial paths, and that's not even integrating what we have going on with the TV show that we're going to be producing, um, the Hard Knocks Life, the Hard Knocks TV show. Um, we have an app that's going to be being integrated as well um, that you'll be able to actually be on your phone, check out the app, and all of our strategic partners will have their products inside of that app. And then during halftime or quarters, um, we'll throw out like, this strategic partner has 20% off. If you go to their app right now, you can get 20% off their product, things like that. So it engages everybody in the arena to, um, to be partners with us. And can like trades happen too? like NFL, like you could, can you trade players back and forth between no. teams? No. What you have, so you have is what you have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And is, is the expectation like be profitable after year three, after year four, or profitable year one? No, I, I'm working towards us being profitable in year one. Okay. I have a, I have a business model that, shows the profitability in year one okay. by the end of the season. Yeah. I would guess you'll have like a lot, a lot of vendors during the game selling hot dogs and Cokes and beer. Well, and well, with that, we have a partnership and we have an agreement that the vendors inside the arena are third-party vendors, so we don't touch those guys. Okay. And in all honesty, I'd rather keep it like that. Um, I'd rather have the third-party keep the concession situation, okay. unless it was in our contract. Okay. But it, it, it's, not, it's not anything that we're, we're overly worried about. Okay. So earlier you talked about how Kent's supporting you. Can you talk about some about how you're going to be involved in the community of Kent in the area? Yeah. So um, I just got invited to sit on the board of directors for Cornerstone Youth Collective. And basically they're, they're, a, they're a business in Seattle that has been around Seattle for a very long time. And, you know, they offer sustainability and support to, you know, underrepresented communities, specifically the African American, Latino, and Native American um, youths, and so being able to get in front of those groups of people and showing them how to become young entrepreneurs, just because of the business that I have, just because of the business model that I have, just because of the organization that I have, but partnering up with the city of Kent and being able to do workshops for the younger generations, younger, younger, younger men and women. Um, because those those young men are going to be our players soon. So we want to make sure that they're integrated with everything they need, all the tools that they need in order to succeed. And we want them to succeed. And when you partner up with a city who wants the same thing, you can't lose. Is it safe to presume you're going to get most of your players from the local area? Like you're not going to bring a player from Dallas, Texas, or Denver, Colorado, I'm guessing? I, I would like for my, and like I said, this goes back to my coach. I would like for my coach to focus on a lot of our players, or at least some of our players, um, to be from Kent or the surrounding areas, because I believe your core energy, your core base starts with where you're playing and everybody surrounding, surrounding that area. So if I have 
a player from Kent and he brings his family and he wants to see him play every other week, that just builds our fan base. Yeah. It becomes our core fan base and they follow us everywhere. As long as that player is on the field and just think, we have that player on the field and then that player gets picked up by the NFL. Yeah. That family is going to be like, you gave them the opportunity to play in front of NFL scouts and now he's playing in the NFL. His dream has come true. And it's not because it's it's not because we made his dream come true. He made his dream come true by what he did on the field. We just gave him the opportunity. We just gave him the open door. What's you know, like the average crowd for an IFL game usually? Like ten thousand. Average crowd? Yeah. Depends on the city. There are certain cities that their crowd is a rabid. Like Wisconsin, they have sold out seven thousand people every game. Um. You have a you have an Everett team. Not so much. Yeah. Um, so there's a 10,000 seating capacity. And uh, if you're not filling the arena or even half filling the arena, that's, that's, that's not. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our objective is to, for the first year, at least have over half filled. And, and people can buy season tickets. Absolutely. So when, when can they start buying season, season tickets? Uh, they're going to be able to buy them the beginning of uh, 2025. Okay. All right. And so a lot of people think like August 11th, 2024 till beginning of 2025 is a long, long time, right? But it's actually not right. It's not. Can you talk about actually some of the things you need to do during that time period to make sure it's set up for success? Yeah. So um, the outreach part is, is actually what's going to be first and foremost. Um, it gives me the time to connect with the community because I haven't been able to connect with the community yet because I've been so busy building this thing. So now that I am not worried about playing in 2025, I get to go to all of those businesses that are going to be strategic partners of ours and sit down and talk to them about the league and talk to them about the arena and talk to them about how we are actually able to build their business even bigger than what it already is. What we're going to do as a partnership, not as a sponsor. I don't want sponsors. I want partnerships. I want partnerships that are sustainable. And that's why I say strategic partners as opposed to sponsors. Because sponsors are a one-year thing. They give you the money, they get their, you know, their, 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 you know, pad or whatever. And then that's it. They got to do it again the next year. I want a strategic partnership that's going to consistently be building, not only for us, but for them. And that's the most important part. I want to do fundraisers at their restaurants. I want to, I want to have them do fundraisers when we're having outdoor picnics. Um, when we're having, you know, um, players signing autographs. I want to be, I want to have our players in their restaurant signing autographs. Excuse me. So Having a strategic partnership with the businesses, but having a strategic contract with the city of Kent, that's the important thing for me. So you have, you know, quite a few advisors. Yeah. And of course, they're going to give you the best advice they can, but, you know, it's from the lens, their perspective. Mm -hmm. How are you going to make sure that you, like, kind of, like, go with all the advice you're going to get and pick what's actually best? Like, filter it out? Yeah, filter it out, yeah. I got to use what God gave me. This is my intelligence. Yeah. And, you know, not every advice is going to be right, but I will, I'll sit back and I'll analyze it and I will extrapolate what I think is most important and I'll put it in place. Okay. Yeah. And for the uniforms, are you allowed, like, you know, like, but I mix it up. Can ABC Towing Company pay you money to put like yes. the logo on the yes. uniform? Okay. Yeah, they can. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it is a, um, we call it, uh, Trying to remember the, the the strategic name for it, but basically it's product placement. Your product, placement. So, yeah. So their business is they'll they'll buy for the first for for a year, they'll buy a um, strategic placement, either the helmet or the jersey or something like that, okay. and they'll have it for the full year. They can do it on the football team as well or on the football as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Is there any plan to like the show we're saying? Like I know a lot of stadiums like have like naming rights that you know be like you know AT and T Stadium, Lumen Field. Yeah. Think so, 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 where, where we do anything like that? We, um, we unfortunately can't, we, we can't, I would love for somebody to actually, and I'm, I'm thinking about where somebody can actually buy a product placement on the field so they can buy underneath the goalpost. Okay. They can't buy on the 50 yard line. Okay but they can buy on each goal post and then they can buy on each side of the field. Are there like VIP suites there? Or is yes. Or is there? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
yeah we we have vip suites um we have we have multiple vip suites that i'll okay. be utilizing all right so let's say it's the first game of the season um you have a family of four that goes to the game talk about what you that you want the experience to be for that family that goes to the first game what do you want them like experience so to speak well when they step out of their vehicle we're gonna have people that's part of the washington rebels giving them their itinerary and there's a possibility we'll be giving some of the younger kids something special because I want them to take home something other than the program. So that's already in the works right now. And then, and this is, this is a big thing for me. I want to tell you this before I get off topic. Um, a family of four can go to our game, buy tickets, buy food, buy, get a program and possibly get other things that they're going to take home for less than what they would actually buy half of going to a Seahawks game and feel closer and feel the electricity and the excitement. What I'm going to do for the first game of the season, I'm giving away. I'm going to say this right. I don't want my coach to kill me. <laughs> so for military families, kids under the age of 16, free entry, military families for any kid part of the military family. Um, and then if you're active duty, we're giving you half off of your tickets for the first game, okay. first season. So from your point of view, what needs to happen for this to be a success? We have to make sure that we connect with the fan base. The fan base is, is, our, is our blood. That is, that is who is going to make or break us. So connecting with our fan base and making sure our fan base knows that we are here for them and that they are, they are the reason why we, are, we even exist is important to me. Uh, after that, just consistently giving them something that they've never seen before, giving them something to look forward to. We have connections with um, a lot of national stars, like TV stars. So I'm kind of building our team with the same concept of the NFL. NFL and the NBA are, are known for having celebrities and stars in their in their arenas and then having them panned and uh the jumbotron showing them off yeah that's what i'm going to be doing and then what's going to what's going to be interesting is if a person wasn't there but they heard about it they're going to want to go to the next game because they're going to want to know what the hell are they going to do next week yeah you know the anticipation the excitement that's what i want to bring back to the kid and then how do you think this fails i don't look at it like that no no okay Failure is not in my vocabulary. Okay. So I, 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 I would be remiss if I even tried to talk about failure when I don't see our team failing. Okay. And you personally, what do you still need to do? Like business wise, personal wise? I'm doing everything. Okay. I'm in front of everybody I need to be in front of. Okay. In front of, <clears throat> excuse me, in front of the most important people in the Seattle, Washington and um, have the best advisors. So if I miss something, they're going to let me know that I missed it and that, they have my back. So they're going to show me what I missed and they're going to make sure I, I correct it. And do, do you, do you have, you personally have any mentors? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, Cheyenne Salah has been my mentor and he's got his, his world is so dang successful. It's crazy. He's got books, music, movies. Uh, the man is, the man is, is the everyday man. And, uh, He's been my mentor from day one, and I am not shy to say that. He has been my guiding light, and I know that sounds weird, but he, is, he has been that star, to be honest with you. Yeah, he's been that. That's where you want to go. You want to go right over there. And I think every successful business person, man or woman, has that mentor that said, if you do this, you will be successful. If you continuously keep doing this, wake up every day, and this is your, this is your lifeblood, not your job, but your lifeblood, you will be successful. And who are you mentoring? Are you mentoring anyone? Uh, I, I will mentor anybody who comes to me and says, hey, you know what? I, I heard what you said. Um, I aspire to be in that space that you're in. I don't want anybody to aspire to be me. I, I, don't, I, I don't look at myself as somebody that you need to be like or anything like that. I want, I want people to be the best version of themselves because that's what I'm trying to be. That's what I inspire my sons to be, the best version of themselves. Um, if somebody came up to me and said, man, will you mentor me? Absolutely. My door is always open for mentorship. Always. 
So NFL, the championship game is called the Super Bowl. What's the name of the championship game for the IFL called? IFL Championship Game. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, no, name. Nothing special. Okay. No, nothing special. All right. Um, so is it, well, and it's supposed to be, how does that work for your team? You're gonna, I guess you're going to have all the TikTok. And, and yeah, we have, we have social media influencers um, that, you know, are working directly with us that they have like 150,000 followers. One has like 1.5 million followers. So once the team is up and running, um, they're going to be using their influence to go ahead and reach out to all the masses. And how do y'all travel away games? I'm guessing y'all have like private jets or anything, but no, we don't have any private jets. No, we have a we have a strategic partnership with a couple of airlines. Okay, okay. yeah. So we'll be traveling. We're we're uh we're in a, we're in the process of purchasing a, a travel bus as well. Okay. And the farthest team you got to play is in Massachusetts, right? East Coast. Yeah. Is there any team down like Southeast Florida stuff like that? No, we have um. We have. Well, let's just talk about our closest team, okay. which would be. California, the Bay Area team, the Bay Area, Las Vegas. Um, Is there one in South Dakota? I think South Dakota. Yes. So those would be the the very easy strategic opposition that we'd be playing with, playing oh. playing against. Okay. Here, is there anything I asked you that I didn't that I should have? Anything else you want to talk about? No, I think we covered everything, man. Okay. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, one more question. So when you try to do these strategic partnerships, why should someone want to be a strategic partnership with the Washington Rebels? Well, the Washington Rebels are the brand new expansion team for the IFL. And anybody that has a business is going to want to be a partner of any sports franchise because sports franchises, even during COVID, there were still sports franchises. So you know they're a financial windfall for any business that's going to be a part of it. Even if... And even if the team was losing, if you invest in the team, it's a tax write-off. For any business, it's a tax write-off. So you can look at it like that. But for me, I think any owner of a business is going to want to sit in the luxury boxes and say, you know what, that team on the field, I own part of that team. You don't, you're, you, you don't get to walk around normally and say, I own a sports franchise. There's only three to 500 people in the world that actually get to say that, and I'm one of them. And the feeling of being able to say that is amazing, but being able to be a part of somebody else saying, we own part of that team. So we wanna see success in that team. And if you own a business, then that means our success is gonna be your success. So we're gonna bring all of that energy, all of that positivity, all of that strategic partnership to your business and see how we can grow. But here's the other thing. Now we have TV rights. So now your business gets to get on national TV along with us. Nice. Eric, can you tell people how to reach out to you, the, the, your email, social media, LinkedIn, or what do you want to do? Yeah, so you can uh, go to my LinkedIn. It's Eric Jackson or Washington Rebels um, at LinkedIn. I believe it's LinkedIn.com. Uh, you can reach out to me at ericj2181 at hotmail.com, my personal email. And uh, you can just type in Google and type in Washington Rebels, and you know, they'll show you all of my LinkedIn information and my Google information. All right, Eric, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. Yes. And to our listeners, thank you for, for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.